mountains still be Strongholds are still being loosed. God, we believe. Yes, we can see it. The wonders are still what you do. We are here. in our hearts. Oh 
We think that our hope is in you, Father. God, that you are alive, that you are moving in our lives right now. Wherever we're watching, God, you are there. God, you are ever present in our time of help. Mm. Reach out to him. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain. I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul yeah the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope I know you are yeah. who could imagine so
Come on, that was mm. such a good time of worship. Yeah. I always love that part of our online experience. Yeah, cool. Before we get to our message today, if you have not had a chance to see the CS groups that we're offering yeah. this season, you've got to do it today. There's some great um, ones. Season has started, it's already live. You can sign up anytime. We have groups all throughout the week. Yeah. So join a CS group if you haven't yet. Come on, I also wanna encourage you, if you haven't yet taken growth track, mm -hmm. now is the time. It's That's led right. by my awesome wife right here. Yeah. She's ready to go. The two best days of your life, the day you were born and the day you discover why. That's right. We want to help you discover your why. Mm -hmm. Lastly, get your notebooks ready. We're about to hop into the sermon. If you don't have this 21 days of prayer and fasting journal yet, hit us up. You can get one of these. Join us. It's been an awesome journey. Get this out. Get ready to take some notes. It's going to be an awesome word. want to talk to you about my first exposure to pornography. It's awkward. Like, are we going there today? And, and we are. I want to talk to you about the first time I was exposed. I remember I was in the fifth grade. It was the summer before sixth grade, uh, 1990, actually. And my friend Jay uh, found his dad's secret stash. Uh, my generation, we didn't have mobile phones. We didn't have the internet. Yeah. So you, you couldn't just, like, watch porn on the couch. You had to find someone's secret stash. You had to it, find someone's, your dad's stuff. Yeah. And my friend called me. He's like, you won't believe what I found. Uh, and I hate to admit it. I didn't walk to my friend's house. I ran to my friend's house. Uh, even though that was more than 20 years ago, I still remember sitting in his driveway. There were several of us and looking at these magazines going, oh, that's what those are for. Um, and there was this rush of adrenaline, wow. this this high, this dopamine release. I didn't know it at the time, but I didn't ask for it. It just happened. Yeah. And following immediately that experience was this, this sense of shame and guilt, like I had done something wrong. Wow. And it was only magnified when I came home. My mom was like, son, I love you. How was your day? I'm like, I'm going to hell, mom. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't say that, but I, I felt that. Yeah. And it started this war within me of where I wanted this rush, but at the same time, I felt this immense amount of guilt and shame. Uh, 47 weeks ago, the pandemic hit America, yeah. and we've talked about how it's been great that we have been in shelter in place because it prevents the disease. We've been wearing masks. We, we're trying to bend the curve, as we've been saying, for yeah. almost a year. Five weeks from now, it has been a year. Crazy. We've talked about the financial pain that this pandemic has caused. Uh, Forty-plus million Americans yeah. have been unemployed. We've talked about the relational. People are more depressed. They have more anxiety. Yeah. Suicide is so high in Santa Clara County, they don't even release the numbers anymore. Wow. Think about that for a moment. These are public information that they don't release because it's so bad. Wow. We've talked about the emotional pain of the election, the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement. It's just been very emotional summer. And then on top of that, uh, articles are coming out that people are cheating more on their spouse than ever before. Ashley Madison is booming. So which is why we did a relationship series called Love Beyond Lockdown. We've talked about all the pain, all the suffering of this pandemic. We've never talked about this subject. Yeah. Uh, this book I read uh, about a year and a half ago called Everybody Lies and Other Statistics. It's about this book that we just lie about our pornography use. And he talks about how in, in our culture, when the, let's say there's two sports teams, let's say the Pittsburgh versus Chicago, and Pittsburgh wins. Every man, almost 80% to 90% of the men in Chicago will immediately go to pornography. Because wow. when you're in pain 
and you don't have God, you seek comfort. Wow. What do you think people have been doing for 47 weeks mm. with financial pain, with relational pain, mm. with yeah. parental pain? Wow. They've been going after this thing. It isn't just an issue in our church, it's a pandemic, which is yeah. why today's talk, for the next two weeks, we're talking about uh, the thirst trap, it's our collection of talks. Yeah. Today's talk is the porn pandemic problem. You got to realize that there's a very real enemy and he just he wants to kill, steal and destroy. He's not playing for games. He doesn't want to be in first place. He wants to remove you. He wants to distract you, disengage you from your calling because a distracted Christian is a purposeless Christian. Wow. Yeah. You got to realize you have a calling from God. Yeah. You have a mission to live and a kingdom to advance. Yeah. And so often he will disengage you through the battle of the mind through lust wow. and he yeah. does it he triggers that through pornography. Uh, I've been pastoring for almost a decade, youth pastoring for five years, 15 years I've been doing this. I've never met a Christian who says, I want to ruin my calling. I want to walk away from God. I want to you know, abandon my faith. I want my, the, those that love me the most to, to break my trust with them. I, I want to sacrifice my faith, walk away from everything that's important for a moment of pleasure and release. And even though people love God, they make that choice all the time. I'm going to ask you a question. How many people do you think are, uh, I'd say, addicted to pornography? And sometimes when you hear the word addicted, you think like the rager, the guy who watches three hours a day, every single day. I'm not talking about that person. I'm talking about the person that looks once in a while, feels guilty and leaves, and maybe two or three weeks later comes back. How often do you think that person, I'm not talking about men, I'm talking about Christian men. Statistically speaking, 64% of Christian men and 15% of Christian women watch view on a monthly basis wow. crazy yeah. i'm not talking about just men in general i'm talking about people who love god people who go to church people who read their bible right. they have this struggle and if you're between the ages of 18 and 30 the statistics are even higher wow. it's 80 percent of people let me kind of put that in perspective for you we're a church of about 200 people we launched about three years ago my wife and i we planted this church at the hotel valencia at santana row and in Three years, God's done miraculous things. We went from eight people on a couch to 200 people. But let's make the math simple. Let's say 50% of our church is men and 50% of our church is women. If 80% of the men, that's 80 out of 100, and then the 15% on the other side, that's 95 people in our church, pre-pandemic, mind you, yeah. were having this problem. How, mu how much higher has it gone? Because of the pain, because of the financial stress, because of the emotional stress, the relational stress. There is a porn pandemic problem. Yeah. God wants to speak into this issue. Yeah. So what do we do? What is the solution? Yeah. The solution, I want to read you a story from a great king, a warrior in the scriptures, a man after God's own heart. This man is a king of kings. Yeah. And there's 929 verses about this warrior. Mm -hmm. Verses talking about how he's a poet, how he's a musician, mm -hmm. how he wrote half the Psalms, how he's a leader of leaders. Yeah. And yet he is remembered for three verses. There are 929 verses about this king named David, a shepherd who became a king, but he's often remembered for the mistake that he made wow. in three verses. Wow. Let me read you these verses. It says in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 11, in the springtime, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. When the king should have gone to war, David stayed at home. And then here are the three verses that, that describe the tragedy. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. David eventually got her pregnant. If you know the story, made a series of compounding mistakes. This, this issue became bigger and bigger, and it blew up in his face, and a lot of people were hurt because of it. Yeah. What happened? Why is David, this great king, this warrior, this poet, this musician, who has 900 verses about him, but often remembered for those three verses? Well, if we're going to describe and define what happened in his life, it's going to help us in our lives, how to be free in, in, in these areas. Number one, if you're taking notes, is this, that David wasn't where he was supposed to be. Mm. 
David wasn't where he was supposed to be. And because he wasn't where he was supposed to be, he saw something he shouldn't have saw. And because he saw something he shouldn't have saw, he did something he shouldn't have done. Yeah. And it cost some people who lost things they never should have lost. Yeah. And it all began, listen, because David wasn't where he was supposed to be. In the springtime, when kings go off to war, David, stowed to, David chose to stay at home. Yeah. I know this about you, that often Christians, the reason why they're disengaged, they're purposeless because they don't know their calling. They know, know they have a mission from God. They forget they have a kingdom to advance. When kings are in springtime are supposed to go to war, when David was supposed to be rallying the troops, he chose to be at home. And here's what I know about you, that, that I'm going to describe a story in, in one of three. And you might fall into one. This might not be exactly your story, but the details will be very similar. Maybe, maybe, like me, you were exposed to something from a very young age. Maybe, like me, you were exposed to pornography. You found your dad's secret stash or a friend showed something to you. Uh, maybe it was worse, and maybe a family member or a loved one yeah. took advantage of your innocence and molested you. Maybe it was someone you were dating, and you never planned on it, but he smelled good, and you were, you know, kissing, and something led to another, and by, you were Netflixing and chilling, and now you're making babies. The clothes are falling off, right? <laughs> And you never realized at that moment you, you were wounded. Mm. You were injured. Yeah. You were hurt. Yeah. In the same way that a, a computer gets a virus and it's affected, you were wounded. Wow. Your mind was wounded. Yeah. You're, you're spiritually wounded. And you were never the same. And you never looked at sex the same. Your innocence was robbed of you. Mm. You didn't choose that. It just happened. Right. And you don't realize this gift, this blessing, this thing that's supposed to be holy and pure. Right. You never see it the same way anymore. Yeah. Now this beautiful thing becomes this perverted thing. Right. And now you, you crave, there's this war going on inside of you. You, you crave this high, this, that whatever it is, whether it's porn or masturbation or just fooling around, and you want that dopamine, you want that release, you want that feeling, but at the same time, every time you go after it, you feel guilty. Mm. You feel shame. Mm. And if you're embarrassed by it, you don't tell anyone, so you hide it. Wow. You justify it. It's not that big of a deal. No, everybody does this. Mm. Or maybe if you're a Christian... You pray, God, remove this thing. God, please make this thing go away. And you have this cycle where you pray, God, I'll never do it again. I'll never do it again. And you have these moments of sobriety. Three days, maybe. Maybe for some of you, three weeks. Maybe if you're strong, three months. But like an addict, you go back. Like the, the, the binge eaters. You eat one, you're like, oh, I'll just have the whole bag. And you're like, man, when will this problem go away? Maybe it'll go away when I get married. Then I'll be, can be with my wife eight, nine times a week. Maybe we're super spiritual, ten, you know. <laughs> And then you get married, and the issue doesn't go away because you don't have a lust issue. Mm. You have a wound yeah. that never healed. Yeah. And David wasn't where he was supposed to be. He saw something he shouldn't have saw, and then he did something he shouldn't have done. Right. Mm. That's when we lose on this battle, when we're not supposed to be engaged in the battles that we're supposed to be engaged in. Yeah. A discouraged, a disengaged Christian is a purposeless Christian. Number two, David was overly confident. Mm. Overly confident. Some of you listening right now, you're like, this is silly. I don't have this issue. Listen, the area where you are gr most confident is where you are most vulnerable. Wow. The area where you are most confident is where, because pride comes before the fall. Yeah. Yeah. Just imagine David's thinking, man, Joab's a Batman to this Robin. I don't need to go to war. He can do it for me. We have more people in the army. I, I can just stay home and relax. The Apostle Paul says it like this. Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, so you think you are standing firm? You think you got this? You think you, you, you can overcome anything because you're a super Christian? Be careful that you don't fall. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I, we started this church in the fall of 2017. We just celebrated our three-year anniversary. It's crazy to yeah. think that we spent a year of our existence in this pandemic. Yeah. I feel like we're two years old again. Uh, <laughs> this whole year has been like one long April. But when we launched this church in fall of 2017, you got to look back even the January 2016. That's when, when I began praying and yeah. fundraising and gathering people. Mm. It's around that time I, God did a miracle in my heart. Mm. And the best way I can explain it is this. I, I, I got along with God for a few days. I said, God, I, I need you to do a miracle. Yeah. I don't want to deal with temptation anymore. Mm. I don't want to deal with lustful thoughts anymore. Yeah. And God did a miracle. Yeah. And I've never had another lustful thought in my life. Totally kidding, by the way. That's the stupidest <laughs> prayer I've ever prayed about. That doesn't happen. Right. You can't pray that prayer. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the reason why is because I'm a man. I can't pray the man out of me. Yeah. Jesus was the God man. I'm the pastor man. I, I can't pray myself away. Right. 
That means even though I'm a pastor, I'm susceptible. Yeah. If David was a man after God's own heart and he wrote half the Psalms, if he can fall, I can fall. Right. And if I can fall, you can fall. Yeah. And you, most people don't realize this is not a power of willpower. This is an issue of humility. Yeah. Those who win this battle are the most humble. If you read any book from the power of habit to atomic habits, it's not those that are the strongest, the most disciplined, that are the most talented, that succeed athletically, that exceed in their careers, that lose weight. They plan to win. Yeah. And those who fail to plan, plan to fail. For example, let me give you an example. Let's say you have an issue with cookies. You don't leave Oreo cookies on the counter. You design a system for your success. Yeah. You hide them in the pantry. So even when you're tempted to eat, you don't see them. Right. Yeah. Men who want to win in this area create environments for their success. Yeah. That's good. Because yeah. so it's not an issue of your willpower. The reason why you keep falling and stumbling is because actually you're prideful. Yeah. For example, some of you, 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 when you're tired, it's late at night, what do you do? You go on social media, you go to the popular page on Instagram and one thing leads to another and like there's a naked woman, right? Mm -hmm. For some of you, it's, your wife goes to bed, you stay up late, you're watching something on TV, and you're alone. And, and that's, that's your trigger. Mm -hmm. For some of you, it's, you know, it's every time you're watching Netflix with your girlfriend, and you smell her hair, and one thing leads to another, and your clothes are coming off. What's your trigger? Mm -hmm. What's that thing that causes you to stumble? Humble people realize they have a trigger. They, they, they plan around it. For example, let's say the Niners are playing the Seattle Seahawks. It's light versus darkness, angels versus demons. <laughs> I'm being serious. The Niners will spend seven to ten days studying their opponent. Yeah. Right. Then creating a game plan. These are their strengths. These are their weaknesses. Right. This is how we're attacking this. The enemy has been studying you his whole life. Yeah. Wow. He wants to kill and destroy you. He knows what triggers you. Do you know what triggers you? Wow. Right. Do you know what causes you to stumble? Yeah. See, this is not, a, this is not a, a victory they're going to win based on how strong you are, how much you love God. Yeah. Are you humble enough? To design an environment where even when you're weak, you're still strong. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies, what, what's your trigger? Mm. Is it when you read those romance novels about that guy who does not exist, and then you compare him to that dud you have at home? Right? Let's be honest. Is it those magazines you read, 10 ways to make him go crazy in bed, and your mind goes somewhere where it shouldn't? What is your trigger? Mm. Listen, let me tell you about the ways I engineer my life for purity. Number one, I never sit alone with a woman. Never sit in a car with her, never talk about church with her, never have coffee with a woman alone. There will always be three. Why? To protect her and to protect me. That sounds religious, Pastor. I know I'm designing an environment yeah. where I can win. Because David was overly confident. I don't want to be overly confident. Yeah. Yeah. Number two, even if I pulled out my phone and I wanted to go to a website, you type in any like swimsuit, the website doesn't even show anything. Mm. Are you that weak, Pastor Ali? No, not always. But six months from now, I might be. Wow. Six months, I might be emotionally tired, physically tired, spiritually tired. Yeah. Why would I not create an environment now that I can win so I can not have to fight that temptation tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah. Write this question down. Why battle a temptation in the future when you have the power to eliminate it today? Come on. Yeah. Mm, you don't fail to the level of your willpower. Mm. You fail to the level of your systems. Wow. David should have locked the door to the rooftop. But he didn't. He knew where he was going. He was overly confident. Wow. He was where he, he was went somewhere where he shouldn't have been. He saw something he shouldn't have saw, and then he did something he shouldn't have done. Number two, three, is that he was entitled. Mm. He was entitled. We are vulnerable to God, to Satan's attacks. Not when we're not just engaged in our calling, not when we're overly confident, but sometimes we have a sense of entitlement. Yeah. David, just imagine his thinking, I have the hardest job in this country. I gotta leave my family, I gotta leave my kids, I, gotta leave. I have to be not only the military leader, I have to be a spiritual leader for all these people. I'm tired. I deserve this break. Wow. I deserve this release. Maybe some of you watching from home, you're single and all your friends are on Tinder, you know, living it up. And you're like, I, I'm not doing that. I'm not sleeping around. This is just between me and by myself. I just want this release. And you're justifying your behavior. Maybe you, you're a spouse and your husband spends more time at work and watching ESPN than needing to your emotional needs. Mm. And you justify an emotional relationship. You're not sleeping with him. You're just confiding in him, talking to him, mm. becoming close because your husband doesn't want to do it. And you're justifying it. Mm. 
Maybe you're a man who has needs and your wife is not meeting those physical needs, so you justify meeting those needs in an inappropriate way. Mm. Listen to me. David just, just, just wasn't where he shouldn't have been. Mm. Right. It wasn't that he was overly confident. He justified his behavior. How do I know that? Because he knew what he was getting into. Yeah. Yeah. This is the Middle East. No one takes showers. This is very different in our culture during the day. Mm-hmm. You sweat all day in 100 degree weather, so you take showers at night. So David knew when he was going on the roof, from his rooftop, which oversaw the city, Mm -hmm. he would see women bathing. Mm -hmm. He knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And when he saw her, it wasn't that he just sinned and saw a beautiful woman. It it was deeper than that. Mm -hmm. He didn't look away. The the Hebrew word is raha. Someone say raha. Raha Raha means to stare intently. Mm -hmm. If If I can give you the urban dictionary, it's like, raha, hola mami. Like that's what David was doing. He was staring. He was looking intently at this woman. And and Jesus is so passionate about this subject. He says, if you look at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery in your heart. But I got my clothes on, Jesus. It's not about the physical. It's about the intent of your heart. And then he says something that goes even further. He says, if if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Remember the first time I read that, I'm like, whoa, imagine going to work and you have a patch on because you gouge your right eye out, right? (laughs) And then you see another dude who's got a pa- Are you a Christian? Did you obey that verse? That's not what Jesus is talking about. Yeah. Say, take this seriously. Yeah. Yeah. This thing will ruin your faith. Yeah. It's like throwing water on a fire. It will quench it. It will distill. It will pull you away from God. Yeah. It will objectify the women that are supposed to be sisters in your life. They'll become objects in your life. Wow. The very thing that you long for, intimacy, closeness, is robbing you of it. Because often you're thirstier after porn than you were before. Because you were never designed for that kind of intimacy. David wasn't where he was supposed to be. He was overly confident and he was entitled. And it's often at this point during the sermon you're beginning to feel the weight of the Holy Spirit. You're like, man, I shouldn't have come to church today. If I could speak into that for a moment, if I could speak to the men of our church, There is a porn pandemic problem that existed before the pandemic, and I believe it just got magnified. I I lost count of the number of guys that reached out to me. I actually wanted to preach this sermon in August, and God wouldn't let me. I wanted to preach in the fall, and God said no, and then in the New Year, he's like, God said, go. Aren't you tired of hiding? Aren't you tired of clearing your browser history to hide that from your spouse? Aren't you tired of carrying this secret just that's weighing you down, this, this thing that's keeping you away from God. David eventually got tired. He was confronted by another prophet, and eventually David confessed his sin. And I'm going to read you his words because they're encouraging for us today. In Psalm 32, verse 5, Finally, I confess my sins to you, and I stopped trying to hide my guilt. And I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave me, all my guilt is gone. How good is that? That David committed adultery. David even then murdered the father of this other man's wife. And God still forgave him. No matter how dark you feel you are, no matter how far away, no matter how addicted you are, there is hope, there is redemption. That you are just one forgiveness away from the mercy of God. As long as you're breathing, there's still hope for you. Come home. Come home. There's a better way. I'm going to give you five ways to be free. In the same way that God set me free 13 years ago, I'm praying that it will set you free. Number one, confess your sin to God. John 1 says, when you confess your sin to God, He is faithful and just to forgive you. How good is our God? That there's no condition on that verse. It doesn't say if you confess 10 times, the 11th you won't. It does not matter how many times you fall. If you confess, He will forgive you. Number two, confess your sin to someone you trust. James chapter 5 says that when you confess your sins to one another, you're healed. Do you see the difference? When you confess your sin to God, you're forgiven. But when we confess to one another, we're healed. There's a victory. There's a healing that you will never experience living life alone. You cannot fight this battle alone. You were made, you were created for community. It's why we have groups. It's why you need other people on this journey of faith. You need people encouraging you, praying for you, but the right people. If you have no one, 
My email's on the bottom, aldi.centerset.church. Email me. I'll pray for you. But I'm going to encourage you to get in a group. You need men that will challenge you the way that David was challenged. He only repented when another man got in his face. Some of you need a man to get in your face and say, you were made for more. You were made for more. You have a mission to live for and a calling to live out and a kingdom to advance. Number three, remove the triggers. For some of you, you might need to get rid of your, your, your smartphone and go to a flip phone. For some of you, you need to block those websites. Not because you're weak and vulnerable, because it's not an issue of your willpower. It's the issue of your systems. Number four, you need to get necessary help. Let me just clarify something. I went to seminary to learn how to read this book and teach it. I didn't get a degree on counseling. I didn't get a degree on marital relationships. I got a degree on preaching God's word. And some of you come from churches where your pastor, your previous pastor, was like a superhero. He did everything. He did all the counseling. All the, I'm not trying to be something I'm not. There are areas I can't help you. You need professional help. And if you're too big for counseling, you're too small for leadership. Some of you need professional help. And I'm not prideful to say I can do every, I can't do everything. I'm average at teaching God's word. I'm terrible at counseling. You, some, some of you need to just humble yourself. Yeah. Say, I'm addicted. This is not a lust issue. This is a wound, and I need professional help. Yeah. Number five, let God heal the wound. Yeah. God can heal you. If he can raise his son from the dead, he can restore your heart yeah. to a heart of purity and innocence. Will it be easy? No. Is it going to happen overnight? It's a journey. Yeah. But in Christ, there's joy. In Christ, there's freedom. In Christ, there's redemption. There is intimacy that you can experience, that you've been longing for, that you've been look, drinking from dry wells. Wow. There's freedom that only Christ will give you. Right. And Isaiah 66 says that as the rain goes forth and comes back and produces crops, so your word, God, goes forth and it never returns void. Yeah. It always accomplishes that there are some of you men at home that you just feel the weight of this talk. That man, I need to tell my wife, and I want to speak to the women of Sanderset for a moment. He might approach you this week. And you have every right to be angry. You have every right to want to punch him in the throat and to shun him. And if I can be honest, you're probably going to feel insecure, like I did something wrong. I'm not good looking enough. And it's none of those things. That the anger that you have towards that person across from you, you think is a pervert, that's, that's broken. He's a child of God that's wounded. And he needs your help. And he can't be free by himself. He needs you to help him. And if he has the courage to ask you for help, don't condemn him for it. Realize this problem is too big for him to do alone and that he needs you. I'm not saying you can't be angry. I'm not saying you shouldn't be upset. But when you get past that, realize his freedom is going to be dependent on you praying together to do this. Men, you're not a victim. You're not weak. Satan doesn't attack you because you're weak. He attacks you because you have a calling. You have a mission. You have a kingdom to advance. Let me remind you who you are. You are more than a conqueror. You are an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony. Because the very same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. So what if you stumble? So what if you fall down? The Bible says the righteous man, the guy who goes to church, the guy who reads his word, falls down seven times, but he gets back up. Warriors lose battles, but they never give up the fight. Get back up if the sun sets you free. You are free indeed. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for everyone who is listening at home that you want to help us, God. 80% God, of the church, Christian men struggle with this issue. God, if David could fall, we can fall. God, we don't want to be where we're not supposed to be. God, we don't want to be overly confident. God, we don't want to be entitled to justify our behavior. But God, in the same way that the enemy has a plan to take us out, we want a plan for our freedom, a plan for our delivery, a plan for our victory, God. If that's you at home, no one's watching. If you want freedom in this area, I want to pray for you. God, I pray for every person that says, yes, Lord, me. That they would begin that step by confessing it to you. Just confess this to him. 
He already knows. And he loves you enough to make a way. Your next step is to get in community. You were created for community. You can't fight this battle alone. And there are others of you, you've been struggling your whole life. No matter how hard you try, no matter how disciplined you are, you can't overcome this issue. Or maybe this is not your issue, but you can't just do good in your life. And the re reality is that you are separated from God. The wages of sin is death. It separates us from a good God. And our good works, our behaviors, our morality can never bridge the gap. But God doesn't leave us there in this broken state. God loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus to live the sinless, perfect life. And he died for us on a cross, the death that we should have died. And the good news is they didn't stay dead. He came back from the grave. He, he resurrected that our old life can die and we can be born again into a new life. And if you feel that urge, that tug, that I want to live different, I want a relationship with this God, would you just bow your head and close your eyes? I'd love to pray for you. God, please, would you forgive me for my mistakes, for my sin, that I've been drinking from wells, God, that I that have not been quenching me. But you said, Lord, if, if we thirst, that we should come to you and drink. God, you said, come and see. Taste that the Lord is good. God, I want a relationship with you. I believe in you, Jesus. I place my faith in you, that you're real, that you're God, and that you know me and that you love me. I don't understand it all, God, but I enough to place my faith and trust and hope in you. If that was you this morning, we would love to pray for you. We, we want to give you these resources called Following Jesus. It's a book that we just give away for free. You want one of these books? Text CS Jesus to 97,000. Someone on our team will reach out to you and give these for free. Uh, let's worship with God together.
I want to challenge you in the area of your finances. For those of you who have never given before and you come every week, I want to challenge you to tip God. There's nothing wrong with taking a baby step in the area of your finances towards yeah. Jesus. For those of you that have been tipping for a season, this is the time where you're going to give consistently. You're going to set up reoccurring giving. That's your challenge. Yeah. For those of you that have been giving reoccurring, sometimes we can become stale and it becomes just routine. And God wants us to grow more and more like Him. This is a challenge for us to grow in. Maybe we're going from consistent to percentage giving. Uh, maybe this is the year you go to 2% or 3%. For some of you, you've been giving consistently in a percentage. It's a time to, to, to work towards the, th the tithe, the, the biblical standard of giving. And there's others of you that the tithe is, you've been there for a season. And, and it's time to, to stretch your faith, to go even further and to give generously and sacrificially, above and beyond. Our tithes are, are, are the 10%. Our offerings are anything above and beyond that. And God wants to challenge all of us, whether you've never given or you're tithing, everyone in the room should be challenged to be more generous. Let's pray. God, thank you so much, Lord, that in the most unchurched region in the entire country, you are still growing your church 47 weeks in a pandemic. God, thank you, God, even through this poor pandemic problem, God, that you are setting people free. You are delivering us. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Be blessed, church. Have a great week. All right, church. We hope you have mm. a fantastic week. Don't forget our yeah. in-person gathering is February 21st. Yeah. Mark your calendar and we can't wait to see you there. Be blessed, church.